this is should be one of its homes. So I, uh, I moved very much by that. So I'm not going to show just these little uh, frolicking rabbits here. There's some other frolicking animals. Um, I wanted to begin just by saying that um, I um, have kind of indulged myself, um, but really with mostly with the students in mind and putting together um, a presentation today, putting together the images and my thoughts and reflections. Um, because there's an enormous breadth, almost 30 years of of work. Um, don't worry, we'll get outside soon. <laughs> um, but um, and, and of course selective in that period of time, but I really want to focus on process and my process has been far-reaching. Um, there's a breadth and not a depth in the, the uh, works that I'm going to show you and the images that I'm going to show you because I think it's so important as a creative person, and again, whether you're in a field of, of science or microbiology, whatever the field is, or the, the fine or creative arts, of having the intellectual and the courage and the imagination to reach out beyond your comfort zone. It's part of, of what it's about. So, um, taken in the studio with a, uh, a whale bone that I found and a uh, not quite finished part of the costume. Various other. Um, and so it's kind of a, a, a whale or a, or a 
a longing, a shouting, a I am here, a vertical against that, that long horizontal, that seemingly infinite horizontal. And then the smaller painting on the right, and this is where slides on the screen are deceptive, um, is sleeping philosophy. Um, in 93 and 94, I was on Fulbright to West Africa, uh, to Ivory Coast, and then I also spent time, less time, in Cameroon. And um, I think part of, part of my longing to go to Africa, which I've had since I was a little girl, as far back as I can remember, was having grown up in the South and wanting to know about this, these lands that so has so shaped and informed culture in the South in, in a huge variety of ways, from, from our food to, uh, to dance, to music, um, to our relationship to, to, to land and ground and house. Um, so um, this great privilege of going there, I, I've spent a year and I've been back several times. Um, was also an affirmation that I longed for of that relationship of art, spirituality, and community. That at this time I, I had lived in New Haven in grad school and then I was living in New York and as you all know the marketplace is a big factor there, the marketplace of all kinds. And so that idea that art could be really intrinsic to a community and of course we're such a pluralistic society here that um, art is, acts in a very different way in the community, in a, uh, in a village of this size, or in villages and towns of this size. Um, but the masquerading ceremonies particularly moved me because they're operas with profound and long mythologies that talk about music, talk about belief systems, uh, talk about the function of the masquerade. And so you have performative arts and the visual arts that come together in these really dazzling displays of virtuosity. And um, so here's just one uh, image from that time. While I was there, I, uh, kind of in, in the first year, I divided my time between uh, doing documentary work. I didn't own a television. I'd never held a video camera. I got one on the black market. There was about half my size, and I was hauling it around. It did a little nerve damage in my shoulder because it was so huge. So at one point, I was paralyzed in my, in my upper right side for a couple of months. Um, and then divided my, uh, the other part of my time in painting. But this uh, is, is a portion of a body of work uh, that was prompted by me saying to myself, I've come this long distance from New York. Why am I trying to paint the same paintings that I painted back in Brooklyn? People were always visiting me, mostly children. A goat would walk in. Um, a lizard would walk in. Chickens were always in and out. I thought, like Scheherazade, I will paint something that is a testament to, or, or it goes some way towards justifying my presence here. I was in a small village. And so I would paint these little pieces on panel. And then in the evening, the children would bring their parents to show them their portrait. Um, and that's me on the lower right side sitting on a goat. Um, kind of the, the, the bruja, the, uh, the charlatan, the witch. Um, the next couple of paintings came out of um, my interest in African art and the centrality of the human form, um, and also the centrality of, of animal image, imagery, which has long been with me. This particular painting is called Divine Horseman, uh, after uh, some Haitian Vodun uh, practices where the practitioner, the, the, the believer, is mounted, overcome, top to bottom, by a horse who delivers 
of spirituality into your body, not just into your mind or into your heart, but takes the whole, the whole person. Um, and of course, that has parallels in Catholicism and Catholicism and beliefs all over the world. So uh, it's also a nod to Maya Darren, the uh, mother of experimental filmmaking. And that's quite a large painting, about eight by six feet. This is much more modest, so we can have a deceptive quality of slides. Also related imagery. And Trabe on the left, um, which is uh, a Haitian, it's a Haitian word, the corruption, French corruption of travailler the French, and uh, it's spiritual work. I don't know why, black mambo, spiritual priestess. Born again with flowers, and again, the imagery of animal um, and, and dancing. And reference to fresh life in the center. Um, one of the more moving experiences. I was in Mali, and uh, somebody had come to the village way out in the, the Sahel among the Dogon people. Somebody had come in with a big load of medicine. They'd been to see the pharmacist. And so there was an enormous celebration. I didn't know any of this was coming down until I started hearing whistles and clapping and people with percussive instruments that were running around. I knew something was afoot. And then I saw this magnificent uh, black, young black steer. He was tied to the only tree, or as far as you could see. Um, and he was sacrificed in honor of this enormous event. Um, and that whole experience, I climbed up on the top of that tree actually, somehow skirted around the, the bull and, and took some photographs. Um, but it was, it was one of those moments that I will never forget, very profound and moving. Chorus, um, again, the animal and human imagery. Um, and, and, and in this work, I was also thinking of rituals of India and the presence of animals, um, the sacredness of animals, and all the religions of the world. One thing that my time in um, Western Central Africa triggered was um, a restlessness with being in the studio, with the solitary practice of painting. And I dance had always been a big part of my life since I was a child. My mother was a dancer, um, sister was a dancer, and it was just part of what we did after a family dinner. Um, somebody started playing music and, and we started to dance. So um, I thought, <clears throat> I really want to bring my paintings into a living situation and be with working with musicians and with dancers. And so, um, little by little, this project, 33 Swoonings, evolved. <clears throat> this, is, this is definitely an homage to Dr. Seuss, who is a big favorite of mine, um, called the Goose Tongue Hat. So if ever you're having a hard time understanding what's going on inside yourself, just make yourself a little hat so you can speak to yourself. <laughs> and you can see this has a lot of undulations. So um, things get, the, the words, the conversation, the interior con conversation gets transformed and enriched along the way there in the pipeline. And this, behind this dancer, um, you'll see uh, projected on the screen a cosmogram um, because for this performance, not wanting to leave behind flat work and imagery, <coughs> and, um, created these cosmograms, which were born of looking at cosmograms or diagrams or uh, glyphs and charts 
across time, I think some of the earliest being Egyptian, that were the counterparts for our current day MRIs or CAT scans, right? They are representations of a given body of knowledge. Um, they're Indian charts that, that talk about a propitious day for a sacrifice, etc. Um, so here, uh, and then also in the top slide, you'll see an image of um, projected image in front of these two dancers, one on stilts, of, of a sculpture. Um, some of my first uh, forays into the three-dimensional world. And here's a cosmogram. Uh, uh, this was also about the time that I, uh, you know, again, thinking of my childhood and thinking of uh, remembering several deaf family members that I grew up with. And so I've always been fascinated with um, how you get along in the world when you don't have all the senses that we take, so many of us take for granted. And, um, and since Braille is such a tactile thing, which has always interested me in painting and sculpture, um, I had some text translated into Braille and something that I've worked with off and on in a number of projects. Some uh, other cosmograms that are a combination of uh, synaptic firings in the brain and, uh, and I, I, uh, part, of, part of another one actually that I don't have up here, I was astonished to see, is a 500-year-old cosmogram from somewhere in the Middle East that looks almost identical to the template for an MRI. And again, part of the imagery, um, and perhaps you can see the relationship to uh, some of the earlier paintings, this kind of diving, rising, hovering forms, and the wheel of feet, um, which was later made into a, a sculpture that revolved. as a chicken and a spider. <laughs> so this is a portrait of the artist in her studio. <laughs> I always thought the spider was a fascinating creature. You don't see a Louise Bourgeois spider in there. Um, and this is the one of the early sculptures that I made. I first started making sculpture in wax, in, in beeswax, and then later on adding different kinds of wax for uh, making them a little sturdier, a little stronger, not being melting so quickly, although that did happen and showed me when my pieces melted right under the light. <laughs> <laughs> this idea of the side of the body multiplying, dividing, morphing, um, so kind of literalizing away emotional states of being. And I, I think part of this is something Tom and Slay and I share, both being twins. Um, I've always been fascinated by that idea that I, I've never, even before I was born, I was never alone. I shared life always with another. But I think it happens in, in daily ways, in our interactions with one another, we're transformed. Of course, we don't sprout an extra limb, but at some, some level we do. Fish woman on the right, and uh, en face on the left. and an installation of these small figures. Protean bodies, Circe, Circe's body. And a couple of, of these figures in bronze. So the um, the crazy thing that this sculpture is, and I, I did a number of, of incarnations of this sculpture, is I just finished this sculpture and I went to, uh, to, to an experimental film festival and a film was being played, a short, with two people in a tiny room with a window, black and white, at the window, a curtain was blurring. 
And the woman was sitting in a chair, and at her feet was another person who, during the entire 10-minute, maybe 8-minute film, was in the process of standing. And when he was fully unfurled, he realized he had only one leg. Not only did he have only one leg, but his body was cleaved like right below the rib cage. And it was astonishing because his movements were full of such power and grace. Three days later, I was at an improv dance festival, and this man comes and sits down beside me in the dark. The performance had already begun. And I turned to say hello, and there was Homer Avila, um, who had, who was Guatemalan, had uh, begun to dance in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I grew up. Um, he went to a disco with some friends, and he was morbidly shy. And some friends said, come on, the music kicks. You've got to get up here and dance with us. He demurred almost till the end of the evening. At the end of the evening, he got up. He said, I never stopped dancing. So he danced with Bill T. Jones. He danced with some of the great companies of New York. And then um, he contracted a very rare form of cancer in his hip bone. And um, so his, a big part of his body had to be taken. Uh, we became very good friends, and he later on choreographed, uh, uh, in, in one of my pieces, choreographed the dancing. It was a great honor to work with him. He died two years after that, and unfortunately I was out of the country. But I kept getting these, I got these phone messages from him. I'm in the hospital, please come and visit me. I'd love for you to come tomorrow night. And I understood from mutual friends that he had invited a close circle of friends to see his last performance. So he danced right before he left us. Another performance that um, still isn't done with me, um, but that started when I was in France in this uh, rich, rich landscape, inspiring landscape, both geologically, geographically, um, historically. So little by little, this figure emerged, this persona, um, which I, I didn't have a name for this figure. I was really thinking about it being um, without gender, being uh, kind of insect-like, trapped in its own web. Um, and I created a mask for my, out of my own face, but that was hairy, had three legs, three arms, and somebody said, oh, it's an oracle. I was thinking about the place of touch um, in our matrix of science and technology. And so the honeybee was a big part of the, was one of the metaphors, one of the figures that I used in projection and costuming. And, and then out of that grew another performance that I did in uh, New Mexico at the Harwood Museum, um, where I didn't have any other performers, and I thought, maybe I could do this in a solo way. So I found this fabulous um, theatrical fabric that uh, picks up light very vividly, and I put a black fabric on the wall, which absorbs light. So when you put projection on this, you have this movable parabolic shape screen and then part of my costume. Um, so I kind of, uh, I used a, a lot of the imagery from 33 Swimmings. Um, but again, I was thinking of the, of the body transformed, the side of the, of the body, the magic of the body. And then it was also um, an opportunity for me to uh, incorporate some spoken word that I was working on at the time. Um, with a, a character named Human Sid, Human Sibling. Um, a number of years after I uh, created Sewing Songs, uh, I began thinking again about the honeybee. 
I didn't want to do performance, but I, I thought, I, I want to make some objects. And uh, so I worked on this project for a number of years. This is part of an installation with a honeycomb on the wall and proliferating around the room. Um, and this is one of the centerpieces of the project. Called, it's a beekeeper's journal or Huber's hive. One of the people that gave us, up until probably 30 years ago, the most in-depth information about the honeybee was a blind naturalist named Francois Huber, Swiss. And the idea of this blind man studying bees, making it his, his life's work, studying honeybees, he, his wife, and a, uh, and a helper just astonished me. So this is kind of a fictitious journal where I have created for myself the liberty of um, looking at the, the bees' habitat, uh, the habits of the bees, the hierarchy of the hive, their extraordinary geometric construction. On the left, it's called Ogichi Tupelo, where the famous Tupelo honey, and those are images of the Tupelo flower and parts of the, of the bee itself. So it's kind of quasi-scientific and, and very much quasi-mythological uh, and then license. On the right is queen. Um, so I kind of thought about that figure as a part animal, which a honeybee is, and part botanical. Something monstrous about the queen who gives birth to every single bee, but is trapped. She has that single nuptial flight. And, uh, and after that, she spends her life enclosed in the heart of the, of the beehive. This is, those are the construction workers. And that's how they form themselves in these parabolic shapes, arm to leg. And when bees are left to uh, their own devices in nature. I'm sure some of you all have seen beehives. They're shaped. They have these, they're like uh, parabolic pancakes. Um, and they, they'll, they'll put stacks of them in a row. Um, and then there's a little bit of braille down there, a little translated with beeswax. I, I find braille such a, a fascinating language. and. Um, an image or, or a performance that I don't have images for here was a, another performance I did in, in a fabulous grotto in southern France where I, which I later learned, had been used to shelter the, uh, the animals. So it had been really the manger for the goats and, and cows, um, probably by the troglodyte dwellers of, of this area in the Luberon. And so I, put, I translated a text into Braille with like marble dust and, and uh, wax onto the wall and, um, and then did a solo performance in there. On the uh, embedded on the back of this piece are a lot of flowers and kind of botanical stuff embedded in the wax. One thing when I was working on this project, one wonderful thing that, that happened is um, my studio is on the ground floor in Brooklyn, and yes, we have trees. In fact, I am the proud owner of, or keeper, a guardian of three big trees. One, a magnolia, um, which is the very first tree I planted. But honeybees were coming, and other bees as well, were coming in and out of my studio while I was working on this project. Uh, with, with all the beeswax, it was so fragrant. And this is a um, part of an installation that I did at, at Pratt Institute in the sculpture garden there. One thing about the, the anthropomorphic imagination for me is that I've, I've had uh, night terrors since I was a child up until probably about 10 years ago. They occasionally happen, but not, they usually don't last as long, and they're usually not so terrifying. 
And so this idea of, of hallucinating, which a night terror is, it's not a really a dream that happens in the first hour of sleep when you actually see things, see projections. And some of these things that I've seen over the years definitely include animals. Um, but, um, so I'm, I'm at home in that anthropomorphizing world. Um, this next project, Zeusia, took its title from a wonderful book called The Mind in the Cave, which is a compilation of the work of many, many scholars and scientists, um, most recently neurobiologists, along with paleontologists and evolutionary biologists, who um, are speculating about the place of, of art in relationship to our Neolithic ancestors, who had brains that were wired just like ours. They're considered to have the modern brain. And um, so they're looking at the art in the caves. How did this, how was this art made by these people 30, 40,000 years ago? Um, and, and as well, what was the purpose of drawing these bison and these horses? And uh, it's a fascinating book. I recommend it to anybody. But beautiful, informed speculation about the place of art perceptions of divinity or something larger than us, ourselves and uh, in the Neolithic world. So Zupsi is where I found that. I opened the book, uh, looking for a title. I think this isn't a very likely place to find a poetic title or uh, a body of work. Zupsi jumped off the page at me. From Zoom, Zoom, Greek for animal or something born of, of, of a womb and opsia for to see. And this body of work was, uh, the catalyst for this body of work was a dream that I had at a very difficult time in my life where I was totally depleted of all resources. And in this dream, this 10 foot hare appeared and picked me up off the ground, and we waltzed, circling around and around across this big green field, something like one of the, the fields over there at the horse stables, uh, rolling hill. Um, and the dream was fabulous, and as you know, certain dreams are, extraordinarily vivid. But the really astonishing thing was that I woke up in the morning laughing, real belly laughter, and I continued to laugh for about a month. I had an amazing energy. And I was telling somebody a few years afterwards about this dream, and she said, oh, well, you had an archetypal dream. Was your dream in April or May? She's a mythologist. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, let me see, yeah, it was at the beginning of May. She said, yes, that's the archetype of the rabbit or the hare who has been used in mythologies and probably most prominently for us in, in Christian mythology, um, been kind of reduced to the bunny rabbit in popular culture, but um, the rabbit occurs in all kinds of mythologies. I was just talking to Fawn earlier. Um, the rabbit is very big in, or hare, is very big uh, in Chinese mythology and often occurs in the moon, stirring an elixir, um, which is for longevity. Labyrinth. And uh, you might recognize this is a work on paper, gouache on paper, that um, is, is came just after or before the, the painting on the far left there. And animal arc on the left of which I've done a, a number of images, but I can think about the arc of animals as being, uh, as hovering above the world. Maybe they're being kind of taken up and saved from disaster. The monkey contemplating human folly. Circle of animals, circle of human, parallel of one another. And here, the uh, rabbit, and there's a, a smaller version of this image there on the wall. Um, but 
I don't want to be too over-determining because I like the idea of interpretation um, in my work. But um, I was thinking of, of, of the hare and the rabbit as uh, a creature that we often associate with vulnerability. And any creature on its head like this is in the most vulnerable possible position. Now, there's something of a violation going on here, whether the, the rabbit is the world or nature. And this is uh, for Fragonard. Inside, I was working in um, southern France again, and uh, definitely inspired by the life there and by the paintings of Fragonard. So it's kind of a an idol, a lover's idol, um, with a hair in the foreground racing off to some appointment. <laughs> some appointment. <laughs> Urgently, of course, put the cell phone in the pocket. Oops. Another of uh, the inverted figures. I was also thinking of volcanoes. Interiority. The gangster rabbit. <laughs> you know they're tricksters. <laughs> Something to the effect of, you know, it's an old grizzled ha hair sitting down at a meal alone with his bib tucked up over his shoulders, but there's grass and stuff slithering down his front side everywhere. I love that interpretation. And continuing with this body of work um, was is a, a show called Why This World, taken from the title of a biography of a, an excellent writer, Latin American, far too little known, called Clarice the Spectre. And the title of this book, Why This World, um, is not a question, although it's posed in such a way that it would provoke it to the think, well, this is a question. Um, so there's a little ambiguity in that. And it also, in the show was the first time that I showed some ceramic sculptures, which I had begun recently to work on. Um, another kind of art, only this time on the tortoise's back. And mirror in the animal in the mirror. My my brother um, was an amateur herpetologist, and, and uh, you know he always had lizards and frogs and snakes in the house and all sorts of insects. And we lived very near a swamp, and um, so I was kind of imagining the poor frogs were vanishing at a dazzling speed. In fact, the vanishing of amphibians. And I'm not sure if I can include reptiles in there. Is to hand them out to the speed and breadth of the vanishing of the dinosaurs. So I was thinking, wow, what if the frogs had their day? I was also thinking of biblical references to the play of frogs. This is called Leap, ceramic sculpture. And uh, why this world on the left? There's a very pronounced spine on the interior of that, that figure on the left. Um, it kind of makes another sculpture inside of the form. And then uh, on the right, you are the biter and I am the meat. Tomorrow the title will be, I am the biter and you are the meat. And it's really about the, the food chain <laughs> in part. So the tail is retractable and it's a serpent. 
I suppose the question could be asked is, is the, 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 did the serpent clean out the inside of the rabbit, or did the rabbit ingest the serpent? It has a gunmetal glaze on it. And the title of this piece, Iranian Sphinx, I was thinking Iran is so much in the news these days, and, and as you all know, that part of the world is the cradle of, of human civilization and of most extraordinary works of art. And now we call that region Iran. And it's still a sphinx to us. There's still so little that we know about it. I don't know how this happened, but it kind of looks like a sports car. <laughs> it's like, wow, I'd like to drive that. <laughs> Might be kind of hard to get in and out of, but be worth it. And then you could imagine the upper body kind of tilting back, you know, when you went up to. 80 and 90. <laughs> Shudder, which I was thinking about rabbits being tricksters and, well, the eyes being shuttered. I was thinking of shutters in the south. You close the shutters to keep the house cool. Um, is this rabbit playing possum? Or is it like this physical world? But the overriding impulse for me in making this sculpture is I just felt the upper body was flattened and then the lower body had all the plump. And so it, it, the sculpture really began with a physical sensation, um, very much a bodily sensation. And I'm still working on the grouping of this out of that. And Pope Joan Noir, the title really inspired by the ears. I was working on the sculpture, and I thought, wow, these ears look like a pope's hat. And then I was remembering Pope Joan, who history has mostly forgotten. And I was thinking about this as a father and child play. Um, far more than has ever been known um, in a 
a certain sense in, in human history, they are vanishing around us, of course, at an astonishing rate. And yet, among so many scientific circles, and I'd love to hear from a scientist out there if there is one, um, the idea of anthropomorphizing, particularly in science, is deemed like one of the cardinal sins. You don't anthropomorphize. But in fact, many scientists think that you must anthropomorphize to a certain degree, not becoming sloppy, but to enter into a more profound rethinking of how we look at what animal life is and animal intelligence and their right to exist. And so, and so extrapolating from that, our relationship to nature, to the larger, the bigger issues of all the species. So, it's a great question. Yes. Um, I wasn't familiar with um, a cosmogram. Could you give us a little context for what those are? Um, well, a cosmogram, as, as I understand it, I don't think I made up that word. <laughs> but, um, you know, it has, it's, it's across cultures, across time. I think that uh, an MRI or a CAT scan, in a way, are cosmograms of the interior of, of the brain or whatever being is being imaged. So it's an imagistic, although it can include text, an imagistic chart or diagram of a certain body of knowledge. Um, in the Kabbalah, in the, in the Kabbalah tradition, there are many cosmograms. Like, one of my favorite is a chart that magic is comprised of lines that zigzag across one another. And so it's, it's created on a grid, and each of the, uh, the points at the outer edge corresponds vertically and horizontally to a set of the 70 essential questions. Did you know there were 70 essential questions that we all need to ask? I love that. You know, that at some place in, in history, some, in some society, many hundreds of years ago, that somebody, some hopeful, hopeful seeker, tried to visualize um, alchemy is full of cosmograms. Um, Indian traditions are full of cosmograms. You know, again, diagrams that are studying the stars, studying uh, the, the moon and sun to determine, along with uh, beliefs and practices of certain deities, um, to study what would be the most propitious day to make a sacrifice so that it would be the most beneficial for the community. So that's, those are some of the ideas about what a cosmogram is. Yeah. Uh, well, this is kind of a crazy question. So. Good. <laughs> it has to do with the fact that we're twins. Uh, so it's obviously weird, but. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing, one thing that's really interesting about the work you led, and this kind of goes back to the anthropomorphizing, is that uh, you know, because we are twins, and because we often see ourselves as fellow or hybrid dependents, is that uh, there's a kind of fluidity of form in my own mind about my own body, uh, so that whenever I look at myself in the mirror, I'm also looking at my twin brother. Um, and it's, to other people, it's unsettling. To me, it's unsettling. Not in the presence of the lion, in the presence, it seems like the most natural thing in the world. And I just wanted you to talk about that because there's so many doubling forms. Mm -hmm. uh, there's very rarely any single form uh, in all of your work. Uh, it's almost everything is being conceived as the body either changing from one body to another body. And in your case, it's like thinking about the image I had of the dragon um, just as you were talking about how uh, the dragon has a dream about a girl dragon who keeps changing into a holy dragon. <laughs> but uh, that's pretty much what Jenny was doing here. <laughs> so I wondered if you could talk about just that. What would it be of it 
That's, that's a great question. I love the way you're, you phrase that, that fluidity of form. Um, you know, that, that, that boundaries are, are polymorphous. Desire moves where it will. Nothing has any shape that isn't overflowing its form. That, that you know, something that's, that I wrote years ago that is like a loop, it's a touchstone for me. Um, and, and I think you're right, for, for many people, it's kind of a creepy idea. For me, it's the most natural thing as, as you know, fried eggs. But um, I'm thinking as you're talking about uh, actually many cultures in West Africa, and I can't speak for East Africa, but have a built-in bisexuality in their spiritual beliefs. Because, for instance, in um, among the Akan people and the Baole people of Ivory Coast, where I spent the most time, people have an other world spouse. So, for instance, I would have made my sculpture or make myself a spouse whose specifications I would delineate. You know, I want him to be dressed in bell bottoms, you know, because I love the 60s. And, so he would be carved out of wood, and he would be my, uh, he would be somebody who would be with me always. So there's this belief that if you come into this world as a female, then in the spirit world, you have a male that provides your equilibrium. If you come into the world male, you have a female in the spirit world that provides you with the wholeness of the human experience. And I'm thinking of, you know, that um, mythology that you, is it, is it Plato's the egg? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you find your other path. Right? right, by putting the egg, egg together. Um, but I love that, that Baole belief, and it's, you know, people know, well, this is an ancient belief, but people still practice this today. They have their other world mate, you know, a, a figure created that they, that they keep. Obviously, they're not worshiping in any way that figure, but it is the figure is a representation of this belief that uh, we have another um, at, in the spiritual realm, and then there's the bodily realm, um, and and that's played out in a number of other cultures and, and through all sorts of really interesting um, artistic practices and forms, performance, and um, but I think it for me. It also, you know, kind of thinking about meditating, feeling the bodily sensations that come out of that, I think it enables, it gives me a little purchase out into the world beyond myself. And sometimes when you go too far in that, it can be a little scary. But for instance, one, one reason that I started the B Project was not only did I precise breathing, not only did I want to get back to studying this extraordinary creature, and especially at a time where it's so beleaguered and vanishing, but part of it was that I couldn't bear to create those, those sculptures any longer. Emotionally, they were just too intense. Um, because, you know, I, 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 it, it, they just brought up so many emotional uh, correspondences and, and resonances for me. But, but I do believe that there is a real phenomenal, if not physical or physiological, reaction as we interact with one another. So I think that we all know psychologically that we're always assembling and dissembling, you know, days that you go into work and you're just feeling like, oh my gosh, can I do this? Dan and I were saying, can I stand up in front of the students today? What's going to come out? And then, then other days where you walk in and you're like, Okay, this is what we're doing today. <laughs> well, well what, is, what is that about? I think it happens bodily, at a physical level. Um, obviously, you know, again, I don't see anybody with three legs or three arms, but, you know, there is, there is that possibility. <laughs> I'm not sure if I answered your question, but it's a good one. We can, we can pick up. <laughs> and yes, your dragon poem. I, I, I meant to say something about that. The fact that there are almost no single figures in any of your works, which in 30 years is pretty interesting. 
Yeah, it sets up an existential anxiety. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Thank you all so much, and thanks again to Mayor Museum and to my friends at BCCA, to Kathy Newman for having such a big vision of all this. And thank you, Tom, for coming with us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Walk over for lunch. Uh, with us is me in the